So good evening, everyone, to the King's Conference Centre in Aberdeen. Before I introduce our speaker, I just have a very quick um, fire drill announcement. If the fire alarm goes off, it is real. It is not a drill, um, and people will direct us to the exits. Um, so it is my great pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Lisa Feldman Barrett to the University of Aberdeen as our School of Psychology Anderson speaker. She is a University Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Northeastern University in Boston, and she also holds appointments at the Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. I think it's fair to say that Professor Feldman Barrett is currently blazing a trail in the field of emotion theory and research, providing a compelling and much needed alternative to some classical theories of emotion. Her work began to take shape in the 1990s when she was unable to replicate some key findings on emotion recognition, and she failed to replicate these repeatedly. Um, proving that non-replication is actually of great value to science, over the next 25 years, she devoted her time to investigating many different elements of human emotion, adopting a multidisciplinary approach um, with psychological, physiological, and neuroscientific methods and perspectives. She is an internationally renowned and respected scientist with over 200 peer-reviewed publications in highly regarded journals. Her recently published book, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain, provides a brilliant and I think very accessible synthesis of her many years of expertise. She also reaches out to the general public um, through clearly written pieces on the web, by giving many public talks, and she also gave a recent TED talk, which has over two million views so far. For her revolutionary research on emotion in the brain, Professor Feldman Barrett received a National Institute of Health Directors Pioneer Award. This year, she was also honored with a Mentor Award for Lifetime Achievement, um, by the Association for Psychological Science. So this award recognizes psychology researchers and educators who have shaped the future directions of science uh, by fostering the careers of students and colleagues. So she's not only smart, but she's also supportive as well. So I know I'm not the only one excited to hear her dispel some common myths about emotion. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lisa Feldman Barrett. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here uh, to talk to you about the work that I've been doing with my lab and collaborators really for the past 25 years. Um, and uh, to begin, I just would like to set a little bit of context that in science, um, there are many examples of fictions. Right? So we used to believe, for example, that the sun uh, revolved around the earth. We used to believe that the earth was flat. And in psychology and other uh, domains that study emotion, we also uh, have some common sense beliefs that turn out to be fictions as well. For example, how many of you have seen this film, Inside Out? Yeah. So supposedly we have little uh, creatures who live in our brains, one for joy, sadness, disgust, one for fear, one for anger. And of course, uh, this movie was made in the US, so joy is the leader. That barely gets a, that barely gets a laugh, wow. <laughs> and I have to say, when I'm talking to US audiences, people kind of blush and sort of like, doubt, you know, duck their heads because every, it's a criticism of American happiness in their preoccupation with happiness. Um, but I can tell you that, uh, that emotions are, are not what most people think they are. When scientists were interviewed, uh, the scientists who consulted with Pixar were interviewed about this film, um, they were very clear about the fact that they thought the film was very authentic in terms of what we know about the science of emotion. And I like to point out to people that just in the same way that we don't look at uh, cartoon physics to learn about uh, physics and we don't learn 
about cartoon chemistry, you know, where people blow things up with colorful liquids to learn about chemistry. We don't learn about emotion from watching Pixar films. So as it turns out, several of our most cherished beliefs about emotions are actually fictions. And so for the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to go about the task of squashing three of them. And the first one I'd like to uh, point out is the idea that emotions are displayed on the face with expressions that we recognize. So people are supposed to smile when they're happy, they're supposed to frown when they're sad, they're supposed to scowl when they're angry, and everyone around the world is supposed to be able to recognize smiles and frowns and scowls um, as expressions of emotion. So much so that people refer to scowls as an angry face and uh, frowns as, as a, a sad face and so on. But consider the evidence. Um, along the horizontal axis here, I'm depicting uh, the facial configurations that are assumed to be universal expressions of each emotion. And so how frequently do people actually make these facial configurations uh, to express emotions? Well, the answer is really not so much. Recently, science did a statistical summary of studies called a meta-analysis and calculated the average proportion of times that people make these facial movements during actual episodes of emotion. And the proportions are listed really on the, on the vertical um, axis. So it's not so much. And there are other, uh, there's another meta-analysis which looks at the correlation between uh, people's reports of emotion or physiological changes in emotion and the expression of the, making these faces and with their, the results are, are pretty identical. Um, if we study children, uh, we see pretty much the same thing. Now, here's how frequently people infer anger from a scowl and disgust from a nose-wrinkled face and a fear from a wide-eyed gasping face. And this is in English-speaking cultures. So in studies where we ask people to name the emotion they see in a face, people use these, uh, they label the faces in exactly uh, the way that we would expect, but actually people don't, um, don't really make these faces all that frequently. Um, and it turns out that people also scowl, you know, when they're not angry, and they also smile when they're not happy. So there's no specificity there. Now, even though uh, English-speaking, people in English-speaking cultures identify uh, scowling as anger and um, pouting or, or frowning as sad, people in remote cultures, small-scale remote cultures, um, actually don't. So uh, in the last 10 years, a number of studies have been published uh, examining how people in remote cultures who have very little access to uh, the cultural practices and values of Western um, urban societies, uh, how they perceive these faces. In my lab, we've gone to um, several places. Uh, we've studied hunter-gatherers in uh, Tanzania, the Hadza, and we've also studied um, the Himba in northwestern Namibia. Um, and these, the majority of these studies, actually all the studies that I'm, I'm pointing out here, really don't uh, support the idea that um, people can recognize scowls as anger and smiles as happiness and so on and so forth. So what's really going on here? What's really going on here can be illustrated nicely, I hope, by this example. Um, this person, if you just show people you know, this face and I ask, how does this person feel? Um, usually people say that this person is tired or they're sad or maybe they're in pain or they're grieving in some way. This is actually my daughter, Sophia, experiencing what I can only describe to you as a deep and profound sense of pleasure. <laughs> um, she's on her second chocolate drink at the uh, Cologne Museum, uh, the Museum for Chocolate in Cologne, Germany. Um, this little sweetie is also experiencing pleasure. So the lesson here is that people move their faces in many different ways during instances of the same emotion. 
Now, if we just look at this little guy's eyebrows, he's actually making an eyebrow movement that we um, typically identify as being um, a display of anger, like in this face. When you show people this face and you ask, how is he feeling, people usually say angry, enraged. This is actually Jim Webb from 2006 when he won the senatorial race in the state of Virginia, returning the Senate, the U.S. Senate, to democratic control with his victory. And when I'm talking to audiences these days, I like to just pause and simulate that for a minute. <laughs> or more than a minute, anyways. Um, without context, we see his face as communicating anger because, in fact, this face does symbolize anger in our culture. So people don't just move their faces in different ways during instances of the same emotion. They also move their way, face in the same way uh, during different emotions. So when it comes to emotion, a face does not speak for itself. When you see emotions in another person's facial movements, your brain is actually making guesses about what those facial movements mean. This occurs automatically with very little effort or awareness on your part. And even if you're somebody who believes that you read people well, that your brain is still making guesses. It's just maybe guessing pretty well. Because under the hood, uh, what your brain is doing, what these guesses are doing, is making meaning of what an, a raised eyebrow means, or what a curled lip means, or what the tilt of a head means in a particular situation or context. So this is how a single feature, like a smile, takes on many different emotional meanings depending on the situation. So when it comes to facial movements that express emotion, variation is the norm. And as we'll see, this is not only true of facial movements, this is true of everything, every aspect that we can measure uh, about, uh, about emotion. So, so what's up with these faces? Where did they come from? Well, it turns out that they actually were not discovered by scientists who were observing people express emotions in real life. These were actually stipulated by a handful of scientists who adopted them as the universal truth and then built a whole science of emotion around them. But basically, they are stereotypes. So what we have really for the past 50 years, particularly when it comes to the study of uh, facial expression uh, and emotion perception, is a study of emojis, essentially. So I want you to consider what this means for a minute. If you walk into any daycare in any part of the Western world, you will see games and puzzles and storybooks and posters that teach people, the children, preschoolers, how to express and perceive emotion according to these stereotypes. And we teach these stereotypes not only to our children, but we also teach them uh, to patients who are having difficulty in their social interactions. We teach in psychology textbooks uh, every existing uh, introductory psychology textbook uh, states that these expressions are universal, universally made and, and recognized around the world. And we also communicate this to the media. Which is part of the reason why we have a growing economy of emotion reading gadgets, apps, and algorithms from tech companies uh, which claim to be able to read people's emotions from their face alone. And if you think about the amount of time and effort and money that companies are currently spending to build emotion reading devices, all based on the assumption that everybody makes and recognizes the same facial expressions, um, at same facial movements as, as emotional expressions, uh, you realize that this is a, a major course correction is really needed here. Because facial movements are not like words on a page that you can read, right? The face, even the body, is not a language that you read. Um, it's a set of interpretations or inferences that you make. Yet, plenty of companies already claim that they can read people's faces. So, I don't want to be mistaken here uh, in what I'm saying. I'm not saying that facial movements are random, and I'm not saying that they carry no information. But I'm saying that the data shows that there's much more variation, situated variation, than the stereotypes imply. And 
uh, the important point is that companies are starting now to sell these devices to legal contexts, to medical contexts, where real people's lives and decisions about their outcomes are being made based on uh, a false set of assumptions. In addition, tech companies are missing a game-changing change, game opportunity uh, to actually collect the kind of data that would be useful in, uh, in learning how to um, automatically uh, uh, detect emotion in other people um, because they fundamentally misunderstand the nature of emotion. The second myth that we're going to tackle today, or fiction, is that each emotion comes with its own signature of physical changes in the body, that each emotion has a dedicated pattern of autonomic nervous system changes, like changes in heart rate, changes in breathing, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, again, I'm going to um, show you a meta-analysis. This one was conducted in my lab. Uh, we summarized over 200 experiments that looked at the physical changes that occur in people's bodies when uh, they are in an emotional event. And we, these are just non-clinical subjects, so these are our normative subjects. And the effect size, meaning the amount of change, is being depicted along the uh, horizontal axis, and the type of autonomic measure is on the uh, vertical axis. So changes in heart rate, Changes in cardiac output are things like how much blood is your heart pumping out, uh, how quickly, total peripheral resistance is, um, you know, how, uh, ease, how easily does your blood flow uh, from one part of your body to another, which is a measure of what, how, how constricted your blood vessels are, and so on and so forth. Um, so here are the effects for neutral inductions compared to a baseline. So this is just when subjects are um, given an, uh, they're shown an image or a movie or they listen to music that sets them to a neutral state. The shape represents the average change from their resting baseline. The larger the shape, the more studies we had to summarize. And the wings represent the variation uh, in the effect sizes across studies. So for example, for heart rate, we had a lot of studies, and for something like skin conductance, which is a, a measure of electrical conductance, how, how much your, it's really a measure of uh, how much sweat are in your eccrine sweat glands, um, so how much are you sweating, which we can measure with, by looking at the conductance of electricity across your skin. Um, and so you can see that there are, um, there's a smaller uh, number of studies that we had to Summarize, that's why the variation across studies in the effects is, is much larger. So if the classical view of emotion is right, and I should have said for the psychologists in the room, um, this is uh, basic emotion, the basic emotion approach and certain versions of appraisal approaches, not all appraisal approaches. If that view is correct, then what you would expect to see is little overlap in either the means or in the confidence intervals of the distributions of effect sizes. So little overlap in the, in the, where the shapes are or in the wings of those, uh, of those findings. And so here are the results for anger, for fear, for disgust, for sadness, and for happy. So what we see is that Autonomic nervous system features are not unique to any emotion category. Instead, there's tremendous overlap in the distributions of autonomic features. So what this means is that when you're angry, sometimes your blood pressure will go up, sometimes your blood pressure will go down, sometimes your blood pressure will stay the same, and the same is true for other uh, instances of other emotion categories as well. And if we do a more sophisticated analysis where we're trying to find a pattern of autonomic changes, for a given emotion, we find basically the same thing. So emotions are not written into your body. They are actually constructed by your brain. Your brain has to make physiological uh, changes occur in your body and then make them meaningful as emotions uh, in order for you to experience uh, or emotion or behave in an emotional way. The reason why this is the case, this meaning-making bit is necessary that your brain has to perform, is that the most intimate part of you, what is going on inside your body, 
is actually largely mysterious to you, to most of us. We're, we're actually wired that way for, for really good reason, uh, which is this. Your brain did not evolve to control your, your brain did not evolve for you to see or think or feel, it actually evolved to control your body. Your brain's business is budgeting the internal resources of your body, like water and glucose and salt uh, and hormones and so on, to keep you alive and well, so that you can, from evolution standpoint, do the most important job that you have, which is to pass your genes on to the next generation. And this budgeting process is largely invisible to you because uh, it comes with a host of sensations that are so uh, continuous and dramatic that if you actually had access to them, you would never pay attention to anything outside your skin ever again. Anybody who's ever had uh, an internal a problem in their, um, in their gut or has had cramps or has had some kind of um, uh, pain inside uh, their torso knows what I'm talking about. Right? Your brain is continually controlling your body those, move, those movements that are occurring inside your body are continually sending sensory inputs to your brain. And uh, it would be really distracting, actually, if you had access sensorially to that symphony of changes that continues throughout your entire life, from the moment you're born until the moment that you die. So instead, evolution gave us a workaround uh, that only hints to us uh, when our body budget is generally imbalanced or generally uh, in the red, and that is what people call mood and what scientists call affect. So affect is, uh, these are physical feelings like um, pleasantness or comfort, unpleasantness or discomfort, feeling um, worked up and alert or uh, feeling calm and tranquil. Affect is with you in every waking moment of your life, whether you're emotional or not, and whether you're aware of it or not. So affective features like valence and arousal, which is what they're referred to in the literature, feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling worked up, or feeling calm, are actually properties of consciousness. They are not synonymous with emotions. Affect basically offers you a quick summary of what's going on inside your body, like a barometer, uh, without much detail. And your brain has to link these simple feelings to what's going on around you in the world so that it knows how to act, so that it knows what to do about them. And sometimes, but not always, the result is an emotion. So, for example, this is how, this meaning-making process is how an ache in your body um, could be hunger if you are sitting at the dinner table or in an audience at 6 o'clock in the evening, listening to someone talk. You're a tough crowd, can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to have to get better with my jokes before the hour is up. I don't know. Um, if you're in a doctor's office waiting for test results, uh, you might experience exactly the same ache as anxiety. And uh, if you're a judge in a courtroom, this exact same ache uh, can become a, a, a gut feeling that a defendant is, can't be trusted and is guilty of a crime. Now, your brain makes meaning of internal sensations in your body the way that it makes meaning of sensations that come from the world, sensory inputs that come from the world, automatically, effortlessly, uh, and with very little energy on your part. But that doesn't mean that you can't control, that you can't uh, actually uh, change the meaning making that your brain, um, that's a very Cartesian way to put it, but you can actually harness uh, other meanings for the same sensory input. So for example, there's lovely work by uh, a scientist named Jeremy Jameson who teaches students who have test anxiety to, instead of making meaning of their uh, uh, jittery, uh, unpleasant arousal as anxiety, which keeps them from finishing their tests and can actually cause them not just to fail their math courses uh, and science courses, but actually drop out of college or university. 
he teaches them to instead make meaning of that arousal as determination, as to getting their butterflies flying in formation to get ready for that big challenge. And this actually improves their math scores. It doesn't actually change the level of arousal that, they, uh, that their bodies are showing or that they experience, but the meaning of that arousal changes. And as a consequence, uh, they do better on their courses, in their math courses, uh, particularly in science courses, and this allows them a better chance at finishing college, which actually has huge financial implications for the rest of their lives. So, emotions are, are not mere reactions to the world. They're actually constructions of the world, or more specifically, they are your brain's understanding of what is going on inside your own body in relation to what is happening in the world, categorizing what is going on in your own body, like an ache, in relation to what's happening in the situation so that uh, it can manage your body budget uh, and, uh, and determine what, how best to act. And so, if you think about it, really what your brain is doing is it's making economic decisions, uh, not about money, but about energy resources, how it should spend its energy and how, what it should conserve. Um, if it spends, is there likely to be some revenue? And so your brain is using past experiences to make these economic decisions in a way that's tailored to the situation that you're in. So your brain is basically asking, well, what, you know, what was happening the last time that my body was in this state and I was in a situation that was kind of like this? So if you consider, for example, the various instances in which you are happy, so for me, that might be taking a walk and uh, in the forest, or it might be lying where I'm walking, or it might be lying on the beach, where I'm uh, lying on the beach with my eyes closed, or it might be baking a cake for my family, or doing yoga, or chatting with a friend, maybe gossiping with a friend, or, uh, or gardening. In each of these cases of happiness, the physical actions are very different. And the physiologist Paul Obrist in the 1970s showed really clearly that physiology, it, your, the physical changes inside your body are associated with the physical actions that you make or the actions that uh, are impending. And so the lesson here is that actions differ. This is true not just with humans, but it's also true you know, with mammals that are studied in the lab, like rats. When a rat is presented with a threat, sometimes the rat freezes, sometimes it attacks, sometimes it runs away. Um, so the actions and therefore the physiological patterns that occur vary uh, across instances of the same emotion category. And also exactly the same pattern of changes can be seen in different insta in instances of different categories. And I'll just give you um, one example of why this matters. In the US, and I, it, I'm sure it's true in other countries too, but the data come from the US. Uh, when women over, women over the age of 65 are more likely to die of a cardiac event, uh, a heart attack, than men. And the reason why is this. They show up to the emergency room and they and their doctors believe that they are anxious. And so they send them home where they have a heart attack and die. So this actually happened to my publicist in the UK when I, uh, you know, they hired a, my publisher in the UK, uh, hired a, a publicist, and actually this happened to her mother. And just a few weeks ago, a good friend of mine, uh, this time a man, um, actually uh, d almost died from a major cardiac event um, so he had a heart attack while he was in the emergency room. And if he hadn't been in the emergency room when he had the heart attack, he would be dead. He had the kind of heart attack that doctors call a widow maker. And the reason why he went to the hospital, he tells me, is that for a week he was having symptoms that he thought, he's also an emotion researcher, I should point out. Um, he was having symptoms that he thought was anxiety. And then he thought, wait a minute, I remember Lisa writing about this in her book, maybe I should go to the hospital. And he did, and he had a heart attack, and they saved his life. So these are not just esoteric scientific debates that amuse scientists in the 
present, you know, in the privacy of their own labs, in our own labs. These are real, there are real consequences for getting, uh, for not understanding the science and getting the story about emotion wrong. The third myth that we're going to tackle today is the idea that there are dedicated circuits in your brain for emotion. So, if you think about the subjective experience of having emotion, usually it occurs uh, in a way that most of the time sort of takes you by surprise. It, it, you know, it feels like the emotion's kind of taking you over maybe making you do and say things that you wish you hadn't. And this makes us believe that emotions come baked into our brains at birth, you know, like we have some kind of inner beast that's lurking there, uh, uh, you know, and that we share this inner beast with, with all the other uh, mammals on the planet. Um, but actually, our experiences of emotion don't reveal the brain's inner workings any more than watching, you know, the sun rise in the east and move across the horizon and set in the west uh, reveals to us, uh, you know, what's actually happening in the solar system. So consider this brain region, which is called the amygdala. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with looking at brains, I'm showing you an image here, which is uh, a cross-sectional cut. So if you were to slice the brain this way, pop open the face and look in the mirror, this is what you'd see. <laughs> Don't try that at home. The, there you have amygdala on the left and on the right, and here um, I'm, I've outlined one. And so, you know, the amygdala is kind of like the rock star of the brain. This is the, if you talk to people in the public, in the media, they don't know the names of most other brain regions, but they know the amygdala. Um, it's really written about in a lot of news stories. Uh, it's supposed to contain the circuit for fear. In the law, people use amygdala activation as evidence uh, of racism, you know, that you were afraid and therefore acted in a pre prejudicial way to, towards other people. So in my lab, we tested the claim that the amygdala is the home of the circuit for fear. We, again, statistically summarized hundreds of studies where people were experiencing emotions uh, while having their brain scanned. And so what I'm going to show you is the proportion of studies that report an increase in amygdala activity during uh, an emotional event, which is the proportions are along the horizontal axis. So in summarizing these studies, we found that indeed the amygdala does consistently show an increase in activity during experiments where people were experiencing fear more than what you would expect by chance. But it only shows this change in activity about 30% of the experiments, uh, which, you know, is much lower than what you would expect if this actually contained the circuit for fear. So you wouldn't necessarily expect every study, right, to show an increase in, in amygdala activity because, you know, there is error and, and so on and so forth. But 30% is not what you would call confident uh, evidence that uh, this is the neural circuitry for fear. Also, it turns out, we saw an increase in amygdala activity for every emotion that was studied. And in fact, the amygdala shows an increase in activity uh, many, many, many uh, times when uh, there's nothing going on uh, related to emotion at all. So for example, if you just show someone a neutral face that is novel that they've never seen before, or a neutral scene even, you will see tremendous amygdala activity to novelty and to uncertainty um, that predicts their ability to remember the information later. So it turns out the amygdala isn't really the home of fear in your brain. It's actually part of your brain's alarm system that alerts the brain to pay attention and learn something new that is potentially important uh, to survival or predicting better you know, the next time. So your brain is always trying to anticipate what it needs to do and when it's faced with information that's never seen before or that's uncertain, uh, and it, it will try to learn it. And then once it does, the amygdala has kind of done its job, uh, and then uh, it reduces its firing. It never turns off its firing because no neurons in your brain are ever off until you're dead. Um, and so there. Um, 
And I should say, these findings for the amygdala hold for every single brain region that's ever been uh, claimed as the location of a circuit for emotion. And the same is true for, uh, you know, the claims that emotions have their own, each emotion uh, category has its own network. And also its own pattern, and so I just want to cover this as well. So now in science, um, there is a, a tendency not just to look at the increases in activity, but to uh, the magnitude of activity, but to actually look for a pattern of change across the brain. Um, so when we analyze brain imaging studies, we take the brain, which is a three-dimensional object, and we divide it up into uh, little three-dimensional boxes called, vic uh, called voxels. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is a pattern classification analysis. It's a, it's a machine learning analysis of brain imaging studies of emotion over the past 20 years. So we took the database that we built, that we're still working on actually, um, uh, of all the brain imaging studies of emotion, and uh, we did a pattern classification on them to try to find patterns that could diagnose uh, the, you know, the, uh, the data from a study so that we could predict whether or not the study was a study where people were experiencing anger or sadness or fear and so on. And so these, all of these patterns actually um, predict or diagnose a study better than chance. So what we did is we ran a pattern classification for all the studies except one. We held one out and then we tried to diagnose it with the patterns. And we just did this over and over and over and over again. It's called the leave one out method. All of these work better than chance. And so the one thing to notice about these patterns is that they're whole brain events, right? They're not localized to a particular brain region or a particular network. And some, this is important because in some theoretical views, emotions are located in the subcortical parts of your brain. So clearly that's not the case. But here's the really interesting thing. People mistake these patterns. You know, normally I say to people, so do you think that these are the brain states of emotion? and then people put their hands up and then I have to tell them why they're wrong. So I'm not gonna embarrass you like that, I'm just gonna tell you, so you feel grateful now, I'm not embarrassing you, um, that these are not uh, brain states. They're not neural essences for uh, anger and sadness and fear and so on. They're not brain states, they're not biomarkers. They are statistical abstractions. So what do I mean by that? In the United States, the average middle-class American family has 3.13 people in it. As far as I know, no family actually has 3.13 people in it. <laughs> Similarly, in order to be diagnosed correctly, in order for a pattern in the brain to be diagnosed correctly as sadness, it has to be closer to the blue pattern than it does to any of the other patterns. But it can be correctly diagnosed without sharing a single voxel in common, which we verified with mathematical uh, simulations. So we can correctly diagnose a brain state of a person or a study by using an abstract statistical pattern, even if the pattern in, in the person's head and the pattern uh, that's a statistical abstraction don't share a single feature. This is not just true for emotion. This is true for every single use of pattern classification and machine learning in brain imaging studies. So every person who writes about mind reading using uh, uh, machine learning is actually talking about mind guessing not mind reading. And in fact, if you take one of these patterns, so these patterns were generated on hundreds of studies. If you take these and you try to predict outside of this data set to a new data set, you can't. And in fact, if you take, now there are six or seven pattern classification studies in the literature. If you take any one of them and try to use them on any other data set, you can't. The patterns actually look different from study to study. The pattern for anger looks different from study to study. That's not a bug, that's a feature. That's not a failure to replicate. That is telling you something about the nature of the phenomenon. You don't just have 
um, multiple uh, ways to express anger. You don't just have multiple, uh, depending on the situation, you don't just have multiple uh, physical patterns that go on in your body during different instances of anger. You also have different brain states that are constructing the experience of anger, depending on the situation. That's because anger, and every emotion category, is a population of highly heterogeneous instances. It's not a thing. And for those of you who are um, you know, suspicious of brain imaging because you know, it's not very precise in terms of its timing and, and spatially and so on, I'll just show you this one image. Um, this is a, uh, these are two brain images, structural images, of two women who are um, identical twins. They are monozygotic twins, so they share 100% of their genetic material. And here what we're looking at is a, a different slice through the brain. So we're, now what we're doing is we're, if we were to lop off the top of the skull and kind of pop it open and look down, that's what we'd be looking at. The front of the brain is at the top, the back of the brain is at the bottom. And what I've done is I've outlined for you um, where the amygdala would be if these women had an amygdala or two. But they don't because when they were 12, the amygdala calcified because they have a disease that um, does such things. And one sister has difficulties perceiving fear and experiencing fear. And for a long time, it was thought that she couldn't experience any fear or perceive any fear, like the famous patient SM, uh, which people used to believe that about SM also. Uh, but her sister has perfect uh, fear uh, experiences and, uh, and ability to perceive fear in other people. She has no deficits at all because her brain is making fear differently. Now it turns out that BG and also SM do experience fear under certain conditions and they can perceive fear under certain conditions, which means that the brain has multiple ways of making fear. In biology, this is called degeneracy, which is a horrible name, but it turns out Every biological system that's ever been studied has degeneracy, meaning more than one way to skin a cat. You know, like more than one way to perform an action. So for example, if you knock out a gene because you're trying to get rid of a characteristic, let's say, and you breed a strain of rats with this knockout gene, to knock out this gene, 30% of the rats have the characteristic you were trying to get rid of, even though they don't have the gene. Why is that true? Because multiple genes can actually produce the same characteristic. So it's not that unusual that your brain should work this way too. So emotions are complex constructions. They are not simple circuits in your brain. You don't have mythical emotion circuits buried uh, deep inside some animalistic part of your brain, even if it feels to us sometimes like that's how emotions work. Your feelings are not, your experiences are not a guide to how your brain works. And furthermore, your brain is also not a battleground between reason and emotion. So lots of people, uh, some of whom I've talked to uh, yesterday and today, believe that emotions and cognitions interact with each other to produce behavior. Um, you know, the recurring uh, belief is, is that thoughts li or rational thoughts live in one part of the brain, that emotions live in another part of the brain, and that thoughts regulate emotions. This is actually one of the most cherished beliefs about what it means to be human in Western civilization. Um, but it actually isn't true. It's not true uh, because emotions and cognitions don't live in separate parts of the brain. Actually, the same parts of the brain that go into making an emotion go into making a cognition and a perception. And these simple feelings of affect, which I was mentioning before, which are um, a property of consciousness are actually part of every thought that you have, every decision that you make, whether you're aware of it or not, because your brain is actually wired that way. Um, so if you are making a decision and it feels to you as if you're making a cold, rational decision, all that means is that affect is somewhere lurking in the background. It's just not in the forefront of your awareness. And so this suggests that we need um, a new definition of what it means to be rational. And the reason why I bring this up is because this idea that we have some kind of lizard brain that's lurking inside our own brains and that's surrounded by that is some kind of an emotion system uh, which is then controlled by cognition which lives in this new part of the brain 
uh, called the neocortex, is actually a fiction. It's basically Plato's tripartite theory of the psyche tattooed onto a brain. Um, it's just not true. And if you think, oh, well, you know, that makes sense, anytime anybody tells you that, um, you know, they, that emotions uh, are part of uh, the subcortical um, parts of your brain, which are then regulated by the cortical parts where, um, where, where um, cognition lives, even if they don't expressly identify themselves as using this, uh, which is called the triune brain um, model, which was uh, proposed by um, Paul McLean in the 1940s, this is actually really, really common um, uh, not just, it's not just the basis of uh, the um, economic theory in economics, it's not just the basis of the, of the legal system, not just in the U.S., but here as well. Um, it's also uh, rooted in, um, in our textbooks and in the way that we explain things as psychologists and neuroscientists. So the human brain did not evolve like sedimentary layers of rock with in, you know, increasing cognitive sophistication over time. Actually, Biochemical studies looking at the, to identify neurons by their biochemical um, signatures shows really clearly that there is no neocortex. Every vertebrate on this planet that has a jaw has exactly the same neurons as you. What's happened over time that as bodies got bigger and niches expanded, brains got bigger. And as brains get bigger, they reorganize themselves. So to the naked eye, it looks like we have new parts. But actually, biochemically, it, we can see that we don't. And so this is a fiction. So what do we know? What do we know? These are all the things that we know are not true. So what do we know? Well, one thing we know is that emotions are not built into your brain. They are built by your brain um, as you need them. And rather than give you a really technical explanation, which uh, I'm happy to do um, after the talk for the scientists in the room, um, I'm going to give you an intuition, really, of how this works. So this is an image uh, that, um, how many of you, by the way, have seen this image before? Anybody? No? OK, good. So, oh, well, OK, one person. Don't tell. OK. So right now, so right now, if I actually had you in a, in a brain imaging, if I had you in a big magnet and I was scanning your brain, your amygdala would be going nuts. Billions of neurons in your brain are trying to make sense of this set of blobs so that you can see something other than black and white blobs. And what your brain is doing is it's actually searching through a lifetime of past experiences, issuing thousands of guesses, weighing probabilities, try and answer the question, what is this most like? Not what is this, but what is this most similar to in your past experience? So the way that the brain makes sense of sensory inputs is to try to give them meaning by retrieving or reinstating past experiences that are similar in some way to the sensory inputs that you are receiving. Now, a group of things in psychology, we call a group of things that are similar a category. And we call a mental representation of a category a concept. So what your brain is doing is it's actually, right now, trying to construct a concept to categorize these visual inputs so that you can make sense of them. And this is happening in the blink of an eye. It took me much longer to explain it to you than it actually takes in, in real time. Now, if you see these blobs, if you still see blobs, well, how many, how many of you here see actually an object? Yeah, so can you say, tell me what you see? A weird walking mat, okay, yeah. Anybody else? Somebody throwing something? A snowman? What's that? Okay, well, what, you're, what most people have, you know, so your brain's working hard. What most of you are experience is, is experiencing is something called experiential blindness. Um, this is what uh, people experience when they don't, they don't have, a, their brain can't make a concept 
uh, for, uh, to help them perceive what, what is uh, the sensory inputs that are in front of them. So now I'm going to cure you of your experiential blindness. And I have to say, when I'm talking to medical audiences, I just love, I love getting out there and, and you know, like being like a, especially in the States, you know, where there are all these like evangelical preachers. And so I'm going to like cure you. Are you ready to be cured? <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah. Want to see it again? Yeah. Okay. So, how many of you now can see something like a bee? Right, okay. So, why? It's, I'm showing you exactly the same uh, set of um, blobs as I did before. Because now, when your brain searches its past experience, you know, there's new knowledge there from the color photograph. And that actually changes how you experience these blobs. So your brain has the capacity to change the firing of its own neurons, even when there's no sensory input there. So if I ask you, for example, in your mind's eye to imagine a Macintosh apple, the fruit, not the computer, most people can do it. If I ask people to imagine hearing the crunch of biting into the apple, or tasting the apple, or holding the apple, most people can do it. And they can do it. If you can do it, what that means is that you have just conjured an amazing uh, magic trick. You have changed the firing of the, your, the, your own neurons in your visual parts of your brain and uh, the auditory parts of your brain and so on and so forth. And so what's happening here is that, that as your brain searches its past experience, it can reinstate part of the neural pattern for that B that you saw. So your brain is actually constructing the image of a bee, even though there's actually no bee present. And this sort of hallucination that you're having to see a bee where there actually are only blobs is actually business as usual for your brain. This process, which goes by various names, um, sometimes we call it memory, sometimes we call it perception, sometimes we call it perceptual inference, sometimes we call it simulation, sometimes uh, we call it prediction. This this is how you know something is important in psychology. Lots of people discover it, and then they give it different names. Um, this is uh, the process by which you experience um, every experience. It, it's, the, it's the process that's responsible for every experience that you have and, and every action that you take. Because your brain has the capacity to reinstate past experiences or combinations of those experiences, um, which is called generativity or uh, which is another name for this is conceptual combination. It can take bits and pieces of the past and combine it in a new way. So you, the ability of your brain to make multimodal concepts uh, is actually a crucial ingredient for everything that you see and hear um, and taste and feel and so on, and even uh, your ability to move. And this helps you make sense of the world quickly so your brain doesn't actually react to the world. In fact, neurotypical brains don't react. They predict, they create a concept, and then they predict what's about to happen next. Um, an actual reacting brain is more like a brain of a person who has been diagnosed with autism. And this is the basis, not just of how emotions are made, but actually how of every mental event is made, um, and also uh, every um, mo movement that you take. This is how your motor system works. There's evidence for, for this from neuroanatomy, from um, brain imaging studies, from track tracing studies of, of macaques, from f in studies of physiology, and um, also uh, studies of electrical um, signal processing in the brain. It's just a, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that this is really how the brain works. So your brain doesn't encounter a situation and then figure out what it means and then react with an emotion. Emotions are what situations mean in an embodied way. So emotions that seem to happen to you are actually made by you, by your brain, automatically, effortlessly. And the emotions that you seem to detect in other people, that you read in other people, are actually partly coming from inside your own head. 
So the punchline in all of this is that you are an architect of your own experience. And it turns out that you're also, you know, uh, as you uh, get older, the, uh, also the electrician. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the ideas that, uh, and the, you know, that are explained in my book with the science behind them. Um, there are about a thousand references in this book and then additional notes on the web for people who want to know more about the science. Um, you can find them um, at this website um, or you can go to my academic website where all of the 200 something papers are um, there available for you to download for academic use only I should just say. Um, the real uh, stars of this show are the people in my lab, um, who are um, some of whom are pictured here, uh, along with the 50 or so undergraduates that are in my lab, you know, helping to run subjects who are, who are not pictured here. We have usually about 50, somewhere between 50 and 70 uh, students uh, every semester. And so I'd like to thank them uh, uh, for helping to do the work that I just, some of the work I showed you today, and also to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a great talk, really interesting. Um, as a token of our appreciation uh, for your visit today, we have a little gift we'd like to present to you. Um, this is a Scottish quaich from which you may enjoy some whiskey if, uh, <laughs> that, if that should take your pleasure. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much to come yeah. for coming this evening. Yeah, thank you thank so you much. Again thank you very much. Thanks.